Hello, I'm Joe W. This is part of a series on the Brown Book, the Amendment 2 of the BS 7671, and at this time we're going to have a look at Part 5. So Part 5, uh, Selection and Erection of Equipment, and I've got the uh, first contents page there. Now as with the other parts of this, there's quite a few changes in that little capitalization or just one or two words change so I'm not going to be bothering with those now the first main thing here is table 51 table 51 itself is not new but the colors in it definitely are so see there the uh, various types of uh, circuits there and the colors which are used for those particular means of identification now at the top there we've got protective conductor protective bonding conductors and functional earthing conductor We've got some letters there which were not in there previously, so PEPB and FE for functional earthing. Those did not appear in the previous version. We've also got GNYE as an abbreviation for green and yellow, so uh, I suppose that's a slight improvement. And the change there is that the functional earthing inductor, which previously was cream, is now pink. So uh, that's a uh, fairly significant change in terms of colour, although functional earthing inductors are not particularly common. But uh, nevertheless, they do exist. One possible example would be on things like RCBOs, where you had that cream-coloured lead coming out, although some manufacturer didn't comply with this thing anyway. But uh, that's an example of what that would be. AC power circuit, that's basically the same as previously, except we've got now letters for the colours, so BN, brown, and so on. And the most significant change here is actually on DC power circuits of various types. Colours for those now are red and white or red, blue and white, depending on how many wires you've got. Previously these were brown and grey, and brown, blue and grey, so red and white instead of brown and grey. And again we've got the letters down there for the various other ones, so the letters are fairly obvious, they're not uh, particularly new in that, they've just been added to this table, so black for BK and green GN and so on. Now moving on to diagrams and documentation. Now diagrams things are always required, so nothing new there. But what is new is the piece here where we've got the requirements of this regulation need not be applied for domestic, which are household premises, or similar installations where certification for initial verification, complete with guidance for recipients as detailed in Phoenix 6, has been issued to the person ordering the work. So things like diagrams and charts or tables and information about the types of wiring and circuits and all the rest of the stuff and all the things you would put on the consumer unit and that sort of thing doesn't necessarily have to be put there provided you've given somebody the actual proper certificates with all the information on it. So it doesn't have to be stuck onto the consumer unit anymore, it can just be given to them in the form of the certificate for the installation. And uh, 51492, this is a new one which didn't exist before, all diagrams, charts and information on instruction notices, and that includes your labels, things for your consumer units and all of that, will comply with these various standards. So rather than it just saying here's an example of it and make it similar to that, it is now specified that it will comply with those various standards, which also includes things like the size of the text and the colour, including the background and the colour of the text and various other things. Now I've still got the uh, standard sort of labels and notices things here. They will mark the change because they've basically altered the size, and in this case uh, important is in uh, all sort of lowercase there with capital I, where it was in capital letters previously. So. Again, some adjustments there, but uh, nothing uh, too disastrous or world-changing. One significant thing which has now gone away is what used to be 51414, that says it has been deleted. This was the one which said about non-standard colours, which essentially said this installation has wiring colours to two versions of whatever. Great care should be taken before undertaking extension, alteration, repair, that all the conductors are correctly identified. So that useless label which you stuck on the consumer unit saying, oh look, it could have old colours and new colours all mixed up, gone away, you don't need to provide it anymore. Because quite frankly, uh, it was kind of redundant anyway, because if how uh, people didn't actually realise that there were different colours in things in use, why were they even working on the installation in the first place? So that has gone away, and I'm sure no one would be particularly sad about that. However, of course, if you take things away, you have to add things back in to make up for that, and what's been added is 51416. The presence of SPDs, or surge protection devices, in an installation shall be indicated by an information notice at or near the relevant distribution boards. This again need not be applied for domestic ones if you've given the certificate and the documents to the person. So, labels for circuit, uh, SPDs, but again, not necessarily applicable if it's a domestic one and you've given somebody the uh, proper certificates and all of that. 
in the first place. And that really applies to all the other labels in here, so that uh, rather than having this massive slab of dozens of labels slapped all over the consumer unit, you can now just put, say, a single label on there, probably with a date or something on it, and then you can give the user of the installation all of that information on the final documentation. Now, whether, of course, this is actually going to work is another matter. Those documents may well get thrown away, lost, or whatever else. They already do. But on the other hand, how many people in a domestic situation even look at the labels on their consumer units uh, from one decade to the next? So uh, it's a change. You don't necessarily need to put on there, but you can still put them there if you want to. It's just that you don't necessarily need to. Now let's move on to table 52.3. Now the change here is that it says lighting and power circuits one square millimetre. Previously it had lighting circuits as one and power circuits as 1.5, as if there was some kind of difference between lighting and power circuits. And then there was a note at the bottom which said that uh, lighting circuits could also include small items of current using equipment, such as bathroom extractor fans, which made it even worse. So thank goodness that nonsense has been removed. So now the minimum size of conductor for any circuit, basically, is 1 millimeter squared in copper and aluminium 16. That's just the same as it was previously. So uh, clearing a bit of nonsense there. Because let's face it, what is a lighting circuit? And lighting circuits often have other stuff on anyway. And uh, the other change there, of course, is the note, which referred to what lighting circuits may or may not conclude, which was note 4. That has gone away. So one of those fairly minor improvements, but uh, makes fairly large difference. So now you can run a socket outlet circuit in one millimeter squared, provided the uh, protective conductor or protective device is appropriately sized. Whether you would want to, of course, is another matter, because that's going to be relatively limiting, but nevertheless, it's now allowed. Now, let's get on to the next big item. 5313, residual current devices, RCDs. Now, this particular bit hasn't changed, but uh, this is what we are essentially talking about. Now, uh, 53132, unwanted tripping. Now, most of this existed before. However, important item has been added, which is uh, indent 2 here. The use of RCBOs for individual final circuits in residential premises. Now, what this is stating is that residual current protective devices shall be selected and directed such as to limit the risk of unwanted tripping. The following shall be considered, and it's now suggesting you should consider RCBOs for final circuits. Now, the reason for this, it fits in with the division of installation, which we covered in a previous video. Essentially, what we're talking about here is that this whole idea of having a twin RCD consumer unit in your house is no longer valid and in reality it's not been valid for years because you're not minimizing the inconvenience as stated in that uh, other section there and this is just really reinforcing that so it's now saying that use of rcbos should be considered which basically means you're going to use them because if you're going to consider them while well, you're using them aren't you now the problem with unwanted tripping is the fact that if you've got say an rcd which covers half the circuits in a house which in a modern house could be say five circuits that RCD goes off, it's disconnected half of your house. That is not convenient at all, is it? That's really inconvenient. So you're not minimising inconvenience by fitting it. RCBOs protect individual circuits. So if you shove a knife in the toaster, the circuit appropriate to that socket outlet will be disconnected. Other circuits will not. And the other problem as well with twin RCD units is the other things which have already been in here, such as uh, in order to avoid unwanted tripping by protective conductor currents and other things currents, you can only have up to 30% of the rate of residual drop energy current present on those circuits. Now, if you've got an RCBO, that's not too bad because it's only a single circuit. But if you have five circuits, that's going to be a lot more difficult because if you have five circuits with two milliamps of normal leakage current from things like filtering and electronic equipment, that's up to 10 milliamps, and that's more than 30% of a 30 milliamp RCD, which is actually nine. So. This is really the nail in the coffin for twin RCD consumer units and good riddance as well. So although it doesn't say you must use RCBOs, the reality is, is that's what you're going to have to be using. And these days, of course, there's not really any excuse for not using them. Yeah, there's a small cost difference between a uh, twin RCD unit and the uh, RCBO equivalent. And if it's a big installation with, say, 20 circuits, then it's going to be a fairly large differential in price. But the reality is that if you've got a 20 circuit installation, putting 10 circuits on a single RCD wasn't compliant anyway, because your leakage is going to be way more than the maximum of 9 milliamps that out, or 30% of 30. So RCBOs for the win there. And a further stoppage for these things, certainly older ones, is that 
RCDs of type AC, which uh, is 99% of those currently installed, shall only be used to serve fixed equipment where it is known that the load current contains no DC components. Now, what this means is that the only equipment you can now use a type AC RCD for would be things like an immersion heater or an electric shower, which just had a purely resistive element in there. So there's no electronic equipment in there. There's no possibility of any DC, including smooth DC or pulse DC or any other weird waveforms from things like motors or inverter drives or electronics or anything else. So basically type AC RCDs are going away and they're going away permanently. Type AC does not comply anymore unless it's something which just has resistive heating elements in it. And that's pretty much nothing. So apart from say an emotional heater, perhaps it doesn't even things like say an oven because pretty much all ovens these days have an electronic timer thing in it or something that you can set the clock on or whatever else. Well, guess what? That's electronics. It's got a switching power supply in it. There's the possibility of DC or post DC components occurring there. So type AC is going away. This means that the minimum is going to be a type A, and that's the one which covers everything AC does, and it also covers post DC up to a certain level. These are actually covered in the previous sections here. That's uh, basically in there previously, so there are types of RCD as we've got there. Now, there's some additional bits here as well to do with the type of RCD. So in AC installations, having RCDs that are tended to be operated by ordinary persons, they will comply with those particular standards. A couple of new ones added there. So BSEN 62423 for type F and type B, and BS7288 for SRCDs and FCU RCDs, and those are the ones where you've got your socket outlet with the RCD built in, or a fused connection unit with the RCD built in. Now 6423 is a new one, that's just been put in because of type F and type B. Those are things you would fit in your distribution board or consumer unit generally. Now 7288 used to be in there, and 7288 was removed in the last one because of some mangle up with that particular standard being rewritten in a way which didn't make any sense. So it was removed from here, but now it's been put back in. So in theory, you can use those socket outlets with RCDs in them or FCUs with RCDs in them if you want to. However, before you get too excited, it's not quite what you might expect because the standards for those still state that if you're going to fit, say, a socket outlet with an RCD built in, you still have to have RCD projection for the upstream circuit. So it doesn't really achieve a whole lot. Also, another thing to be aware of is a lot of socket outlet RCD is still on the market today are type AC. And of course, as we saw previously, type AC can't be used for anything other than resistive load. And of course, if it's a socket outlet, you've got no idea what somebody could plug in. So that kind of rules those out anyway. So are those 7288 is back in, which might imply that socket outlets with RCDs in can be used. In reality, they're still not particularly useful or practical. So basically, I suggest ignoring those and not bothering unless it is a very specific installation requirement that you need to have those as well. And the other thing as well, in certainly a domestic environment, sticking in a socket outlet with an RCD built in is kind of pointless because the circuit's going to need an RCD anyway, partially because of the standard that says so, but also the cables on the wall are more than likely going to require it anyway. So it's a fairly irrelevant and uh, mostly spurious addition there. Now we can also see it's been added up here in 53136. Again, just putting it back in from where it was before, but uh, basically forget about them. They're not uh, useful or particularly relevant anymore. Now, Table 537.4, which is uh, guidance on the selection of protective isolation and switching devices. There's a lot of things marked here which apparently have changed, but what's basically changed are some of the standards and the numbers here, most of which is fairly minor changes, but obviously just refers to the uh, particular standards in question. So a lot of marks there, but uh, it's generally just the uh, numbers that have changed. Over on this side, some of the uh, notes or indents have been uh, revised or possibly adjusted. What's been added here is it now has AFDDs as well as circuit breakers and RCDs. The rest of that is uh, pretty much the same as previously. And then this one here, which uh, didn't exist before number six, the switch of a socket outlet is not required to be suitable for isolation as isolation is achieved by withdrawal of the plug. So socket outlets can be used as isolators and they don't need to have a switch at all. You can just have one with no switch. But the point realize that the switch itself is not necessarily suitable for isolation. Now, this doesn't really have a big effect because if you're going to isolate something, then you're going to unplug it. And that's pretty much been the case uh, forever. And it's just sort of reinforcing that fact. So if you went to someone's house, and if you were like a repair person that deals with washing machines, 
just turning it off at the socket doesn't mean you've isolated it because the switch is not isolation. So what you should do, and I'm sure all the appliance repair people will actually do this anyway, is to isolate the appliance. You are unplugging it from the socket and then that is your isolation prior to you actually working on it. Now moving on to 544 which is protective bonding conductors and uh, main and protective bonding in particular. Now this existed previously but it has been expanded somewhat and the part that's been added is where we've got the part here about where an installation serves more than one building. Now previously it didn't exist so we've got where an installation serves more than one building a main protective bonding conductor shall be selected in accordance with the characteristics of the distribution circuit protective conductor for that particular building. The cross section shall not be less than 6 mm squared and not need exceed 25 if the bonding conductor is of copper or a cross section area affording equivalent conductance in other metals. So this is where you've got an installation that covers several buildings and it's now per building rather than just at the main origin which is kind of what it was previously. Now table 55.1 which is about plugs and socket outlets below voltage circuits. That's all the same. What's been added is this note. So USB charging ports, coaxial outlets, data outlets, HDMI and other AV outlets are not regarded as socket outlets for the purposes of this regulation. This is fairly common sense but uh, just sort of reinforcing the fact there that a, uh, so a coaxial outlet for your television is not a socket outlet as referred to in the previous parts. So they don't need shutters or anything like that and of course they never had them anyway so just sort of an addition there to confirm that point. And the final part about uh, in part 5 is uh, 56069. This is in the section about electrical sources for safety services. Now a couple of changes here. This change is basically changed to the numbering. It's now G98. Previously it was 83.2 and 59.3. So they've basically just rewritten all of those. And of course G99 being the other one that's been changed. And then note 3 has been added, so guidance on the specification of wiring systems and safety services may be found in BS 8519. So, as we've seen previously, a lot of these have been added in, saying obviously rather than putting all the stuff in here, there are standards that exist which already cover these things. So that's part 5, and that's the main changes there. There were some other minor ones we didn't cover there, but uh, that is the main takeaway from that. Now next time we'll have a look at part 6, and also appendix 6, which goes with that. But until then, thanks for watching.